Okay, good afternoon uh, here in the US. The time zone is different. Welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to Morgan State University. Um, I welcome you to our research series organized by the Intellectual Committee at the Department of Advanced Studies, Leadership and Policy. This is one of the largest graduate only departments with 200 plus doctoral students. Uh, this committee organizes a regular talk series on a wider range of higher education topics. Um, today's session focuses on research and publication, and I have invited expert scholars from different fields and institutions to share their publication journey and then tips for publications. Um, I sincerely appreciate you all for joining us this particular hour, despite your busy schedule. Um, I have two items on my agenda uh, here. The first one you will hear from our panelists on their views, views on the research tips and publication opportunities. Um, the second one, you will meet the winners of the Global Essay Project organized by the Star Scholars Network. Uh, we'll also take questions from our audience, uh, members in the audience. My name is Krishna Bista and I'm a professor of higher education at Morgan State University. I'm also the founding editor of the Journal of International Students and the Global Student Mobility Series editor for Outlage. Um, I invite all of you to respond this particular question using the chat room and maybe your recent publication as well. Please continue using the chat room. Uh, the bigger question for the day is what what tips or suggestions do you offer for our emerging scholars who are excited to publish their articles and their books? And we have a scheduled 60 minutes for this afternoon here. Let me welcome and invite our panelists for this particular hour. Each panelist will take maybe a minute or so to introduce themselves and share um, their recent publication or current projects. Uh, let's follow the same order as you see here on the screen, uh, starting from Lisa all the way uh, to JR. Floor is yours. Okay, uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Lisa Flores. I am professor in Air Diversity Division in the Department of Psychological Sciences at the University of Missouri. I am, serve as PI or have served as PI on three different NSF grant projects that have supported my research. I am past editor of the Journal of Career Development. I served as editor for that journal from 2005 to 2022. I'm current associate editor of the Journal of Counseling Psychology, and I'm also the legacy and form editor for the Counseling Psychologist. Over my career, I've served on the editorial board for about six or seven other journals as well. Um, my research is focuses on the career development of women and Latinx individuals and the integration of Latinx immigrants in rural community in the, in the Midwest. And I have published over a hundred journal articles, book chapters in this area. Thanks. Hi, everybody. I'm Dr. Colleen Doyle. I am originally from Indiana, but I reside in Ireland where I work at University College Dublin. Um, I consider myself a research practitioner, so some of you may uh, be aligned similarly. Um, I brought a prop with me for this um, activity. I recently contributed a chapter to this book, um, and even though it's not really my area, I have a wide range of interest. Um, I primarily am interested in student experience, first year transition, emerging adulthood, um, but I broke out of my comfort zone to uh, publish a chapter in a book on queerness and higher education with colleagues from University College Dublin and Maynooth University. Um, I'm absolutely delighted to be here today. Um, I also recently published in a Star Scholars publication, I published a case study of Irish students uh, studying abroad in America. Um, and I have um, a very proud one peer review journal article in about emerging adulthood 
uh, for those of you who like that topic in the Journal of Higher Education Research. Um, no, Higher Education, <laughs> HRDSA, Higher Education Research uh, and Development. I think I've just screwed up my own uh, introduction there. But anyway, I'm delighted to be joining you uh, evening time in Ireland and I'll, I'll let the next person speak. Thank you very much. Thank you, Colleen, and well, thank you, um, everyone, and it's a wonderful being here. Um, I'm very honoured. So I'm Birgit, Birgit Schreiber. I've got one foot in South Africa, where I've worked and lived most of my adult life, and I've recently moved to Germany, so I'm in the centre of Europe at the moment. Well, we all think we're the centre of somewhere, but somehow it does feel like the centre here. Um, and I'm here, I'm part of the Africa Centre, so my research usually combines an African perspective and an emerging perspective, a global South perspective with um, perhaps a more established um, knowledge and disciplines and scholarship. Um, I've been in student affairs most of my life. I've published not quite as much as Lisa, but um, also quite a lot. I've been on executive um, editorial boards and I've, I've started our journal 10, 10 years ago, a journal of student affairs in Africa. So I'm quite versed in the writing process um, and in the publishing end and the back end of that writing process. And I hope to share some of my um, thoughts with you a bit later. Just quickly, um, what I recently published and what's been very exciting is that I've been part of a team of collaborators. It's four of us from four different continents and we've been writing quite prolifically about um, data we collect across the globe in our different regions. And we put that together and a lot of good has come out of that. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, good to be in this space with all of you. I am Chris Salinas, Associate Professor at Florida Atlantic University. Uh, my research explores how historically marginalized communities experience the three levels of oppression at the institutional, cultural, and individual level. Uh, I am the founder and editor-in-chief for the journal Committed to Social Change on Race and Ethnicity published uh, in partnership with the National Conference on Race and Ethnicity. And I've served on many other editorial boards, uh, have uh, written or edited a total of six books, uh, and I look forward to engaging with all of you in this conversation. Hi everyone, I'm Michael Fall from the Office of General Counsel, a little different uh, place from the rest of my colleagues here, um, but I also have a PhD in administration and higher education uh, and uh, published in uh, book chapters and have uh, various reviews and institutional um, texts to have. Um, uh, lately, I was a uh, case study uh, in a recent uh, book that came out, The uh, International Student Identities and Mental Wellbeing, um, and then uh, also working on law review articles. My prime preliminary uh, area of expertise is international um, study abroad and, and liability issues associated with that, as well as international student issues uh, in the United States. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you again for the invitation, Dr. Vista, and I'm really delighted to be here and especially among um, such esteemed uh, panelists. So I clearly remember attending this very session last year, and the session provided me with very helpful insight in guiding my publication journey, and I'm very um, excited to be here today to share my experience. So my name is Marsha Sun, and currently I am studying at Oklahoma State University, pursuing a PhD in educational leadership and policy studies in higher education. And my in research interests focus on cross-cultural um, integration process and developing programs to better uh, support and foster a sense of belonging among international students, retention and access for international students, and the intersections of identities and cultural competencies in higher education. So recently, I had the opportunity to work with Dr. Vista um, in the publication of the chapters of the book, International Graduate and Doctoral Student Experience, Navigating Relationships and Resources and Resilience. Hello, everyone. My name is Ken Guan. Uh, I'm currently the director of student engagement at Fuller Theological Seminary. It's such an honor to be here, and I recognize many uh, familiar faces, and thank you for having me here. Uh, recently, I contributed contributed to a, <clears throat> a book chapter in uh, actually one of our uh, participants here, uh, Dr. Katie Ku and her colleagues. Uh, I contributed to their book. Uh, name uh, is called uh, intern. Uh, it's called the uh, uh, international student identities and mental health, and I co-wrote a, a chapter with uh, another three scholars and practitioners 
uh, is called Welcome to the United States Promising Practices for Orientation Programs that Support International Student Mental uh, Wellbeing. And uh, my research interest is in um, uh, measuring, assessing institutional efforts in integrating uh, and engaging students, uh, particularly on the international student side. So nice to meet you, everyone. Hello, everyone. My name is Liz Neria. I am an international student. I'm currently a PhD candidate in the Program of Educational Leadership and Policy Studies at Oklahoma State University. I am the editor of the online publication, The Scholar Practitioner. Um, I am working on my dissertation, which is focused on student leadership development. And I am also working on several collaborative uh, research about hidden student populations, um, international students' experiences, as well as experiences uh, of doctoral students. My recent publication is a book chapter about how international students fostered uh, leadership resiliency during the pandemic. And I am so glad to participate today in this panel. Hi, all. my name is Jay Arguo. Again, uh, thank you, I like, thank you, Dr. Bista, for this invitation. Um, very honored to be here. So, I am a professional speaker. I specialize in DEI and mental health. I have spoken, trained college students at over different 50 different universities. So, so yeah, so it's a privilege to be here. And this is my first time to publish something. So I feel extremely excited and honored. So I got invited to, um, to be part one of the authors for this book, International Student Identities and Mental Wellbeing. And my chapter, which along with my co-author, Dr. Mandy Hansen, we focus on the mental health considerations for East Asian international student men. So it's a case study book on uh, specifically focusing on international student men from Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, and Vietnam, because these four countries are one very similar uh, historical cultural similarity, which is Confucianism. And the chapter, the case study uh, is about how universities, uh, different student affair programs, and even on the academic side, because I have, uh, I also taught at University of Colorado a couple of times, a handful of times. So how these programs can sufficiently support these international male students from these East Asian countries. Um, so yeah, so thank you all. Thank you. So this is fabulous. Anyone in the room has any questions about the publications or looking for the journals at the book project, this is the group to reach out. If we cannot address the problem here, probably no one can do it. So please, if you have any burning questions, anything, you know, please reach out to this group. So I, I feel so proud and privileged to have all of you together on the same platform. So we move on to the discussion. Um, I do have a couple of questions for the panel. Um, so let's move on this, the very first question here. Um, what was the most challenging aspect of the publication process for you and how did you overcome it? Um, maybe some of you can chime in, um, maybe starting uh, from Lisa. Sure, thank you. Um, so for me, I was very involved in research as a graduate student. Um, and my, I think, a uh, very pivotal moment for me was when I um, submitted my dissertation project for publication, and I got the reviews back and read it and drove home that night thinking, I am not cut out to be a researcher. Um, like, this is not for me. I read it as very critical, um, as a rejection. When I shared the reviews with my co-author, she had the complete opposite reaction to than I did and was super excited. It was like, Lisa, we have an opportunity to resubmit it. Um, so for me, I think the most challenging aspect was not knowing that there is this journal culture. There's a culture to publishing that as even as a doctoral student, I don't think I fully understood. And it took some time as a professional 
submitting my own work, but most importantly, I think serving as a reviewer, serving as an ad hoc reviewer, serving as an editorial board member, seeing the other side of the process, not just as the author part, but seeing the process from the um, reviewer's perspective, um, really just opened my world to learning that this is a process. There's some really key parts of this culture that you don't know and won't learn without just trying and without working with people who have experience in the, you know, with publications to be able to tell you, oh, that revise and resubmit is actually a positive decision. And nobody gets accepted. Nobody gets their paper accepted. I don't think I have ever had a submission accepted with the first review. Um, so I think just learning some of those pieces through experience and through collaborators has been really critical for me in my journey and in, in development as a researcher. So um, Lisa, it's so great to reflect on that sort of personal part of that writing process. Um, and I thought for me also, what was very important in writing and getting a piece done is knowing what my style of work is. And when you recognize your own style, I work very well with people that compliment me. So I, and my style has changed over time, um, but I sometimes get quite, um, I struggle with deadlines. I struggle to, when I set them myself, I struggle very much because other things creep in. So when I write with others, they keep me to my deadline. So I write with teams. So 80%, 70% of my work has been publishing with collaborators, with partners, a friend, a colleague, or a team. And that has helped me stick to deadlines. We meet every two weeks, things need to be done. So I know what my strengths are, and I partner with people who can compensate and work with me on the areas I need um, support on. So that has worked for me. The second part I thought I reflect on is, in terms of what to write about, I think it works well to write about things that you know about. So write about your experience, your lens, your vantage point, your place that you're in, the context you're in. That is really useful. And then sometimes comes a time when you think, because there's an area I really don't know much about. And you immerse yourself and you force yourself to write something in that area. So in the SDGs, you know, the SDGs have recently, over the last five years, become important. We all kind of need it to learn about that. And I threw myself into that and I forced myself. So on the one hand, write about what you know, but also if there's a gap, identify that and go for that gap and see and, and read up on it. And, and the last one, Chris, I just quickly, I want to pick up also, and, and, uh, I share with Lisa um, that feeling that reviewing manuscripts help you get a lens for how one writes. So offer yourself as a reviewer in journals for books, um, get involved in the publishing side. Of course, publishing is, you know, the other side of the submission once you submit it. But review articles, because that'll help you be kind of a disciplined writer in terms of, you know, what am I talking about? How do I locate what I write about? And how do I discuss my findings? So um, engage as a, or, or review as much as you can. I think that skills the eye, it skills the mind. I can share my so uh, I have to, again I have to start off with thanking my co-author Dr. Mintin Hansen. W without her encouragement, I probably wouldn't do this. And you know, like because talking about challenges is is that like I throughout my whole life I hated writing. <laughs> I can just tell even when I was going through getting my master, I just hated writing. And last five years, I committed myself every month I would write a blog. And I would send it out to my followers. So I started writing more and more. And I would say one in five of my blogs is, is researched. I heavily researched my paper. For example, I, I, I've written quite a lot about um, Asian American men and mental health, right? Based on research, well, different mental health articles. So, so and then so when men, Dr. Mandy Hansen, when she approached me and, and asked me if I want to be a co-author, of course, it, it, this talking about mental health, it, 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 this anxiety, that this self-loathing, that like, there's no way, and you know, I'm not smart enough, you know, especially a, a journal, an academic journal, right? Even though I have worked with higher education for over 15 years, 
but still, and I taught classes at University of Colorado, but you know, like in my head, so I'm not a PhD, I'm not like a full bright professor, you know, full right, you know, you name it, right? All, all these internal struggles, negativities. I think that was the hardest thing for me to overcome. Even when I was writing it, right? Even when I was submitted for editing, you know, like when, when, when I, I see Katie Kuo and, and other editor, when, when they send back feedbacks, you know, like, is that there were like more red lines than, than black font words, you know, it just, it, it hurts, right? <laughs> Not only hurts, it, 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 again, it, it, it brings up all these self-doubts that like there's, I can do it, I cannot do it. But again, I, I have to give a lot of thanks to my co-author, Dr. Mandy Henson, and then kind of going back to what, um, uh, Brit, Bridget, uh, is that what, what, your name? What we're talking about is that ultimately I, I keep writing, keep moving forward because this case study, this chapter about East Asian international student, male international student, is it, based on my own experience. It's something I'm very, very passionate about. As an immigrant, as an international student, I went through the challenges and I have working with majority Asian American or Asian college students across the country, I seen, I have experienced seeing their similar challenges that a lot of these students are going through. And all we need to do is provide that little additional support that could make their life experience in the United States on a higher campus a little bit better. It's that little support. Therefore, just having this why, this motivation, something that I love, that I'm passionate about, that I care, that kind of guides me through all these internal and external challenges. So thank you. Colleen. Hi, everybody. Um, I have two things that come to mind in terms of the publication process. Um, one is flexibility and the other is time. And for me, they're both related. So um, when you're in a practitioner or a student affairs professional role, you may not have the time to write during your day job. Um, or as I've experienced, I um, had a boss who simply did not understand why I might want to take part in publishing and writing and scholarly work. So that, that was quite difficult. And so in order to do what I wanted to do, I needed to find the time. And it meant that if I wasn't permitted or allowed to do scholarly work during the day, nine to five as part of my role, then as I was so driven, um, then I was gonna have to find the time in the evening. And that can be really, really difficult. Let's just be honest about it. So in terms of flexibility, said, said book proposal came out. I knew I wanted to uh, contribute. It was an area I had never worked in before on a scholarly level. But because I faced so many challenges, I had, a, I had a notion of what I was gonna do the research on in order to publish in the book. But because of all the challenges I was facing in my day job, I had to be flexible and shift gears um, to the point that I pulled in two more co-authors and did a very different piece of work as to what I had anticipated from the start. And in fact, the proposal that was accepted was going to be very different. Now, thankfully, um, thankfully, the editors were happy to get, you know, sort of a counter argument as to why the proposed chapter was going to change radically um, and why it was going to be better than what was previously proposed. So I just want to plant those seeds of, of flexibility, whether it's the journal you're approaching or the methodology you're using or the line of argument or whatever, and being able to find time because that's what it takes to publish. Thank you so much. Um, this is wonderful to hear from you all. Um, let's move to the second questions I, I do have um, for the panel. How do you choose the right venue for your publication and what factors do you consider? Maybe starting from Chris. Yeah, um, hello everyone again. So there's a lot of factors that I play a role. I think number one is uh, me being a, uh, well, when I was on a tenure track, I had to consider what does my university uh, considers for my promotion and tenure. Uh, so that's number one. So I had to look for journals that are uh, ranked in my peers, my colleagues uh, perceived as high ranking as well. 
So that's number one. Number two is I had to think about timeline. And at the beginning when I was publishing, it is hard to know how long some journals will take. But the more you do it, the more you learn each journal. So there are some journals that I know it will take up to four or five years to get published, right? I have a couple of pieces that it took me four or five years to get uh, submitted for review, revised and resubmitted, and, and if it, it got accepted. Uh, so that's what the other thing that, I, that I, I have learned to understand the process and how long each journal might take. But in order for me to understand and learn that process, I have to submit and be patient. Also, I have learned to be a collegial uh, and respectful to editors and to the reviewers. Because even as a reviewer, I hear or get a lot of, uh, have received a lot of mean uh, um, emails, uh, rude emails. Uh, you know, I think one of the things that I think about is as an editor, I'm doing other people's research, not my own research. Right, but I think uh, I am committed to doing this work uh, to help and ele elevate other uh, scholars and other uh, people in, in this platform. Uh, and to finalize my last thought is, based on the last question, one of the things that I have learned is that I have to read in order for me to write. If I'm not reading, I can't write. Yeah, if I could just piggyback off that, I thought Cristobal said something, you know, finding, you know, related to where you are in life, right? So, you know, if you're looking for tenure, you know, at your school, there are very specific A journals that they want you to publish in and those are requirements. In fact, um, you know, having the experience that I have here, I also handle all the immigration for the university, um, is that, you know, when you're looking at, and this just got me into the faculty hiring process more so than I'm sure any general counsel ever has, is you learn what the exact requirements are for business and for finance, and you learn the journals, and you see how candidates are judged against their publications. And so if where you are in life is you're publishing for your future, then those journals absolutely matter. Um, I will tell you about a different track for those of you who are not tenure track, is for me, it's the journals that I read the most, and those are the places where I want to be published. Those are the con conversations I want to contribute to. So, you know, for example, I'm not aware of a single job on this campus since we don't have a law school uh, that re requires publication in the Journal of College and University Law. Um, and it took me four years to get pu my article published in there. But it's published. It's there. I'm very proud of it. I've added to the, the, co the conversation. And that was my goal, right? And so to, to try to help out other scholars and to open a field of inquiry that, that others could contribute to. Um, so that's 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 was my factors. And so then after that, I, I also had a dissertation that I want to get published. And so then I tried to look at I had to step outside my own comfort zone for what I read. And what do the what do individuals with with these focuses read in mind were international students attending uh, university uh, law schools or American law schools and um, looking at where's the best place to publish those. And while and to go back to something that I think um, was said before is that sometimes you may think your article is awesome, other people may not, it's how you build from there. And I was rejected from almost every journal I submitted my dissertation to. Luckily, there were the nice people who were putting together the international student identities and mental well-being and allowed me to uh, pair that topic down to a case study, which I think uh, was helpful and contributory. But it really is, you know, are you married to your work or are you comfortable changing journals, making a derivative of your work, you know, in what venue, what voice do you want to have and how do you want that voice to be heard? Well, I, uh, I'd like to contribute several advice. Um, I am currently a practitioner and my work is, consists of uh, working with all populations on my campus and uh, I really don't have a lot of time uh, to write. But after I graduate, but something I really wish is publish my dissertation, but I think someday I will make sure to do that. Uh, actually, I have started the process right after my doctoral program, and I, I remember one of the <clears throat> best advice I received from my, my advisor, uh, chair of the committee, is that is to shoot high. And uh, it seems very... Uh, intimidating uh some big journals and uh as a new scholar or a new uh a doctoral grad and how am i going to publish that uh, uh an article in the, such a uh prominent journal 
Well, the side benefit is you get precious, precious feedback uh, that will help you to uh, improve your writing, your uh, the knowledge you contribute. And um, without further ado, and another one is uh, earlier, Crystal Ball mentioned about having a timeline. So really time yourself well. And I remember I read something uh, about stagger your timeline. You can plan to publish, uh, for example, four articles a year or two years, but then each has a different timeline. So while you're waiting for feedback, you can submit something else to another journal and another one. So you have four at the same time. You don't have to wait for one article to be published and then write another one. Uh, another one would be address to the population and targeted audience. I will have to mention that I, I highly benefit, I benefit from reading Journal of International Student. And uh, many articles that I, I quoted in my dissertation and uh, is from this very uh, this excellent uh, journal. So journal like this uh, address to the special uh, specific population and targeted audience. They will have colleagues who want to read your articles. They're desperate, want to know uh, what you know and what you have to share. And, and also write about what you're interested. Uh, from my work, I, you know, I kind of got interested in uh, student, con student government and online student engagement. And those are uh, fascinating to me. That gave me motivation to write. And, and so I can benefit myself from doing the research, the scan of the environment as well, benefiting my colleagues. Um, also, can you publish something from your previous work? Don't let those work go in vain. You know, if there's, uh, uh, just don't be picky. If there's a journal, art, a journal would like to accept your, your previous work, do that, you know, from your previous presentation, from your class paper and, um, by all means, and your blog. And uh, last but not least, do you have someone, can you uh, co-publish with someone, uh, whether it's experienced scholar, your professor, and a seasoned professional? Um, if you don't have, feel free, you know, definitely go to attend professional conferences and network. And then your friends, your colleagues, and you, you all can start collaboration to, you know, the opportunity will come to you then you can start publishing. For example, the art article we just collaborated on Dr. Ku's uh, a book. This is from a networking, from, from a circle of uh, colleagues we co wrote, wrote together. Well, when you are a, you know, a novice researcher like me, sometimes, you know, uh, we can uh, look after those journals that we, you know, some professors or colleagues recommend us. But I think that's something that I um, just go and look after in those journals is to, to look for the aims and the scope, um, you know, because sometimes I think that, oh, my proposal or, you know, my study can fit. But if I go, you know, and look for articles that are published in that journal and, you know, read deeply, you know, on that aims and scope, maybe it can, it couldn't, it, it, it won't fit so well. So I think that one thing that I, I check, you know, after looking for the journal is the aims and, and the scope of that, of that journal. And, you know, as my colleagues all, already said, well, I also check it, it, it is whether uh, peer review, uh, because that reflects a quality, you know, in the process for selection and publication. And also I consider, you know, in indexing of the journal or whether it is open access because those things will give exposure to your, manu to your manuscript. Um, yeah, so when, yeah, that, that would be, you know, some recommendations that I can give as a novice re researcher. Well, uh, for me, I think the process of selecting the appropriate venue for publications has become increasingly complex due to um, the proliferation of journals, areas of specialization, and emergence of interdisciplinary topics. So I, for me, I think the first thing I would say that it's very important to join the STAR Scholars Network, and I believe um, Dr. Bissa is the vice president for the STAR um, Scholars Network. So once you join, you will have access to various um, opportunities to consider your venue for publication, such as the annual global conference, um, the Journal of international students, the Journal of Comparative International Higher Edu 
Education, alleged study of global student mobility, and Journal of Trauma Studies in Education, just to name a few. So after researching on this topic, um, these um, I have four um, factors that I keep in mind when selecting uh, the venue or journal that is a good match for my research. So the first question I ask myself is, uh, what are the aims and scopes of the venue and journal, um, like my colleague uh, Liz said. So I think this information is usually readily available on the journal's homepage, and I usually look for the section title about the journal or full aims and scope or something similar to that. And then um, browsing through this page will provide me with key information about whether my research might be a good match for the journal. So the second question I ask myself is, has the journal published articles that are similar to my work? So once you have identified a few journals you might like to publish, Publish your work, uh, your manuscript based on their broad aims and scope. Consider performing a search with the keywords or titles of your manuscript to de determine whether the journal has published work that are similar to yours. So I try to aim to identify three to five papers published within the last five years to try to determine whether these papers are similar to my research um, in terms of quality and scope and identifying um, previous published papers um, in my specific uh, sub area is an excellent evidence that your research topic um, is of interest to the audience um, of that, that particular venue, which will increase the chances of review. So the third question I ask myself is, what are the journal's restrictions? I think it's really essential to check the information for author section for your targeted venue or journal to determine the restrictions. And sometimes it's very important to know that restrictions are also related to word count. So, um, and I, I remember Liz and I um, had trouble uh, really um, concising our manuscript to fit the, um, the size of the restriction for um, the authors. So the fourth question I ask myself is, um, what is the journal's um, impact factor? So the validity of the journal's impact factor as a matrix for journal quality is controversial due to many factors that can influence the rating achieved and the fact that not all of these factors are directly related to the quality of publication within the journal. Um, this is the reason that I um, consider this as my last factor. Um, however, the impact factor remains as a default method for determining the quality and reputation of a journal. So um, just in conclusion, so after all the hard work that goes into performing a successful research, the final crucial step is to choose the right venue to publish. So I read that there are over 9,500 journals in the directory of open access journal alone. So I think choosing the best one is can be very daunting. So I think keeping in mind the four points that I talked about, um, the aims and scope, the identifying the paper that are similar in quality and scope, and then determining the restrictions and the fourth one, considering the impact factor um, and the potential reach could ensure a smoother pathway to publication. Thank you so much um, to hear both from the scholars, you know, doctoral student and faculty in the room, and also practice in a raise eye opening. Um, I do have one more question if anybody wants to chime in regarding the improving the quality of the research papers and making them more appealing. Uh, panelists have touched some of the aspect. Uh, we, we want to take one or two responses quickly. Anybody's okay. If I, if I could just write the opening and just Please. get going and then go back to the opening at the end and make it the strongest, most compelling two paragraphs you've ever, you, you can write. Like really it's, it, you think about the, 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 the amount of papers that people have to review. And I, and I've been on a couple of conferences for, for my own professional and, and it's really about getting started. So just whatever the opening gets you started, that's great. But then go back and make sure that that opening is really strong. I think that's the people have a, the, it, when you look at journals and how they're published, really, two, three paragraphs is all you see on that first page. And you have two and three paragraphs to get people to the rest of the article. I, I, I totally agree with that. I think even before that, um, and this goes back to some of Marcia's points, um, really, really reviewing the manuscript submission guidelines. Um, each journal is gonna have different guidelines, maybe different formatting styles that they use and different page lengths, making sure that your manuscript is prepared according to those guidelines. Um, I would also recommend that you have a colleague, multiple people review and give feedback on your paper before you submit it. I, I would say uh, for me as a reviewer and as an editor, before I even start reading it, I 
will know, get a sense of if the paper or the manuscript is going to be good just by the quality of how it is prepared. Um, but then um, certainly, as Michael had mentioned, after reading the first page or two pages, if you haven't hooked me in by then, you're not going to hook me in in the details later on. I, I would just chime in for a little bit. Um, so I think there are um, several um, tips that you could consider. So the first one I would say is to have a focus and a vision for your research paper. So I think the, it's key to um, successful publishing with a high quality article is to get a vision. So a reason, a purpose for writing um, the paper in the first place. So once you have a vision for your research, um, it may be useful for you to write down and keep it in a constant view to remind you uh, of your mission. So the second one um, tip is to decide on the type of academic um, article that you want to write. So there are so many um, options for you to select from when you're considering the prospect of publishing scholarly work. So for writing academic article, you can choose from different types, such as empirical research, conceptual or theoretical articles, uh, teaching notes, review papers, field research, technical reports, case studies, analyses, industry reports and reviews book reviews, commentaries. So I think it's really important to determine the type of article that you want to write about and focus on that. Um, so the, the last tip that I would say is, um, the, I know this is very obvious, but the title, abstract, and keywords are um, very essential because they uh, summarize your research paper. So the title, abstract, and the keywords should uh, be optimized to reflect your main uh, research questions and the purpose of your paper, and then also exhibit um, publishing trend in a particular field of study and in terms of the concepts used by the other researchers um, to find papers similar to your articles. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is Dr. Ribi from Biology Department at Morgan State University. I'm very happy to be here, and I'm so proud of what uh, Dr. Krishna is doing, uh, organizing this. I didn't even know it happens every year. Uh, I think at this point, I would love to join the Star Scholars. Uh, I love to publish. For a long time, I've not been publishing, and i um, I want to get back into it and I'm encouraged by knowing that people have gone through challenges writing. I feel so encouraged. So that's my contribution. I think I'm going to be networking with uh, Dr. Krishna and uh, maybe uh, some of the people on the panel. Thank you so much for coming and enlightening uh, and encouraging someone like me. Thank you. Wonderful. Any other comments, questions you have for me or the panelists? Yeah, well, preparing your questions, let me quickly summarize the, some of the main things that our panelists have pointed out earlier. The first thing was the time management. If you want to write, if you are hungry, I think you should go kitchen and make some foods. Uh, and the other thing is, as a, as a scholar in the field, we have to be prepared being uh, the rejection. Every single article will get one or two rejections before it goes to the next step. And that's happening even for me after publishing many, many articles in the books. And that's the same stories uh, you have heard from the room, from all of our panelists. The writing, nobody loves the writing, writing like this technical um, work, like the journal article or the book projects. It's a practice. Once you start writing, it goes fast. The other thing we have heard from the two of our doctoral students and then panelists that support, support is essential, support you can get from your um, professors or peers, you know, their uh, essential feedbacks are very important to move forward. And also Liz pointed out, uh, Marcia pointed out actually, there are more than 9,000 journals. Yes, there are even more than that. And it's also our time to know which journals uh, is suitable for our field. Also be careful on the uh, predatory journals, journals that ask you to pay and publish tomorrow. That is a promise like this. Also, you have heard from our panelists that it took four years to get through one particular article. That was my experience as well. At least I had to wait two years or so. Um, and also go by your need. Need, you know, whether you are going up for tenure or promotion or writing for the your doctoral requirement. Before doing that, please read, 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 uh, read to write. That's another feedback that you heard from our um, uh, panelists. The other thing is 
how do we go with go with the trusted associations like AERA or STAR or CIES, particularly the professional field in your uh, area, pro professional organization in your field. Um, so I have taken those things here. And then the other good point came out, uh, about the editors or the reviewers. How do they make decisions? Actually, they smell, I smell like a food. As an editor, I smell. If I look into the abstract or overall general formatting, the general layout, that will tell me, you know, the work. I can easily uh, determine an article or a book chapter within a minute. Um, or the other colleagues have mentioned that write two appealing paragraphs. As long as I see something appealing, why I should consider, why is it different from the rest of the, you know, manuscript that I'm collecting for the book or journals. That's something I was taking notes earlier. So again, time to take questions, please. I think this is from Tian Quinn. Thank you everyone for sharing your insight. I'm wondering how do you find someone to collaborate on the writing a book chapter, any successful stories to share? So that's one of the questions. All right, anyone wants to chime in from the panel? Hi, I wrote, I wrote a, a little response. I think um, if you can attend a conference in person, it's really those in-person contacts that's the best way to net network. And I know that can be very difficult because of the distance to the conference or the cost, um, but really um, it, it's a great investment in, in terms of, of lots of things, um, but particularly meeting people. Um, that's, that's my advice. Making sure you're, uh, 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 making sure you're very active on social media can also be very helpful. Um, there's quite still an active, um, group of scholars on Twitter. Um, you know, if you have a favorite author, um, follow them on social media. Um, oftentimes you'll find your little community of like-minded people following and commenting, and that can be a great, a great way to make connections. Can I add to that? I no, think please. as an emerging scholar, I remember just starting with my colleagues or my cohort, my friends, right? Um, because you have to start somewhere. Um, part two, I think about reaching out to people that have similar <laughs> interests and research interests as yours and build a community, but be consistent. There's so many times that people reach out, uh, that, but they don't follow through that deadlines. And I know someone mentioned deadlines, accountability with other people. Uh, right. So if you look at most of our CVs and resumes, a lot of our publications are with colleagues, not too often by ourselves. <laughs> One of the things that I, I that was an editor um, in some journals, you know, you, you I mean, you shouldn't be plagiarizing and copying and pasting from your dissertation is plagiarism. So you want to make sure that you before you click. Uh, so you before it's published and ProQuest or so on, uh, uh, you can delay it and or. Uh, try to publish before it's, it's posted. That's the other thing, because other some journals uh, will ban you from publishing there again if you plagiarize your own work. Uh, that's the other thing that I have uh, I have seen and engaged with other colleagues. Uh, but my colleague Colleen uh, brings an excellent point: social media. So what do I do once it is published? M promote it yourself, right? Uh, and they, we haven't even talked about it in all metrics plays a significant role in how journals get ranked and how you could uh, do outreach. And Twitter, it's a good way to uh, get your all metrics up by just retweeting your article. So every time you get retweeted, um, it's like an extra cookie you get. Uh, one of the ways to make contacts uh, is by, just like me, I wrote about the three abstracts and I checked uh, some of the scholars name and I sent them by email uh, wanting to collaborate with them and seeking their advice on the very uh, topic. So I sent about uh, five uh, uh, abstracts to some of these uh, uh, scholars. So two of them responded, whereas three, I couldn't hear for three of these very scholars. Uh, to replied and giving me the uh, positive uh, response. And this way, I, I started partnering with them. So to the, to the person that asked the, this question, I believe you can as well follow this very option. Uh, I believe by the time you send out three or five abstracts to some scholars that are in the same field with you, uh, I believe uh, one or two of them uh, must agree or uh, may have agreed uh, to uh, work along with you. 
Oh, you got it. So I am a third year doctoral student uh, at FAU, who was just recently honored as a uh, home scholar. And so one of the things that that interests me, you know, in listening to all you talk, and I think it's great and it's wonderful, but but you know, they're the fear factor from a student point of view. So how give me some tips on how students can approach a faculty member who might have similar interests in terms of how they they would be willing to work with them. Good question. I asked the panelists just to use the chat room to respond to that question. And also there is a couple of, there are a couple of questions. Um, I, I would like to quickly update um, and address one of the questions about um, how to be involved in the journals. I think you know, in the rooms, everyone is pretty much the editor of at least one or two projects. Please reach out to directly to them um, and uh, be requested to be on their editorial board or the project they have because everyone needs a helping hand. Um, I do have several journals, as you see on the screen. Please feel free to reach out to me or the editor of the particular journals. You can copy me so that you, you can be on their editorial board. For the STAR scholars, uh, everyone is required to go through their training. Training is about one and a half hours. Uh, the, the link should be on their website. If not, please reach out to me as well. Um, I know we have about five minutes and I have the second agenda, um, but continue, you know, the conversation in the chat room. Um, so we have again nine, no, now 10 professional journals, all led by the editors at different public research universities in the United States. Um, and they are open access, no fees for the publication, um, um, and then free to read forever. Uh, also, we have a book project, the book project in partner with Rartledge, Taylor and Francis uh, Springer and Paul Grape Macmillan. We publish roughly 15 to 20 books a year. Uh, that's a huge work. Uh, so you have uh, those opportunities. Uh, moving on, um, I'd like to share to you that the Star Scholar runs annual project, which is called the um, Global Essay Project. And the submission can be accepted in eight different languages. Um, so also I have a good news, um, time for good news. We have three scholars in the room who are recognized for their outstanding work. It's the participant and author of the Global Essay Project. So this is an annual project, as I, as I said earlier. Uh, the project invites individuals to share their experiences of studying or working outside their country of origin. Uh, whether you are a former international student, current in international student, or study abroad, or, or faculty on a, on exchange or Fulbright, you know you have a, you have a story to share. Um, and the scholar in the book project they share their stories. Um, so uh, please join me in congratulating our first winner of the Global Essay Project, Dr. Roger Anderson from Central State University. He is in the room. Uh, congratulations, Rogers. He wrote an essay on returning home a guardian. Okay, congratulations. The second winner is Dewey Ender Annie uh, for her essay on the journey from uh, Australia. Um, and uh, congratulations, Dewey. The third winner uh, of the essay project is Jasmine Hertz um, for her essay, Sun, Strength, and Thousand Layers of the Sand. It was written in German. Uh, as I said earlier, the project are accepted into eight different languages. This year, we chose only three uh, essays, I mean, three languages uh, to include in the book projects. So the good news for all of you is um, everyone in the room will receive a complimentary copy of this publication. I will follow up uh, after this session. Um, and also I'd like to invite you uh, to explore a Millennium Scholar Program, one of the mentor mentee program where you get the opportunity to participate as a professor or as a, as a student, as a mentor mentee. Also we have upcoming conference in Spain um, from October 9th through 10th. Um, so we have two more minutes. Uh, we can take questions. Um, any notes from uh, you all? I know everyone is quiet here. Do you have any final notes or questions, thoughts? Just thank you all for your time. I greatly appreciate this opportunity to sit here and learn from everyone. All right, thank you. Then we are at the end of the program. I appreciate all of you for sharing your entire 60 minutes with us.
Um, thank you. And I look forward to seeing you at another session. Have a good one.